morning, everyone. <laughs> I really appreciate how you came out here on this gloomy Saturday morning and joined us. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, my name is Benjamin Ely. I'm the Executive Director of the Berks History Center. It's my pleasure to have you and welcome here. And if there's anything we can do to make your visit better today, let me know. But, uh, I just have a few announcements before we get started here. Uh, we have another program coming up on Wednesday this week. It's going to be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it is the story of Sydney and Esther Pratt. They're Holocaust survivors, and they will be here with their grandchildren doing present presentation on uh, Wednesday afternoon. And we can uh, register for you. Uh, that It's a pay at the door, but we can get you signed up for it at the front desk here before you leave today. Next Saturday, hopefully, we have sunshine uh, we have our road ramble that we've done each year coming up on uh, the 21st, this coming Saturday. It's from 10 to 4. We're going to start you off in Leesport, and we're going to take you to Cookstown, and we're going to take you on a beautiful route, and we're going to tell you some stories. So if you think you'd like to be part of that, stop at that front desk. The front desk can solve a lot of problems for you this morning. Uh, November 3rd, uh, we have, it's a Friday. And we'll have an evening program from 6 to 8, and it's titled The History of Golf Runs Through Berks County. And we'll have author, author and golf enthusiast Tom Walker here telling stories of Berks County's rich history uh, and the game of golf by highlighting the personalities and the events that shape the sport, both locally and globally. And the event will also feature uh, Hallie Vaughn, who will speak about the achievements of Berks uh, women's golfers, too. And so we'll have a nice little program here. There'll be a couple of activities for everyone to enjoy. So hopefully we, we can see you here for that as well. And then our next second Saturday program, which will be November 11th, uh, from 10 to 12, right back here in the auditorium, we'll be honoring our World War II forgotten heroes. And we will have historian Dennis Damiani talking about the patriotic story of Homer, a local boy who lost his life on a submarine. So we hope we, uh, we'll see you back for some of these programs here. And I uh, hope you'll, you'll join us in, in getting good weather for next Saturday for us. That would be very kind of you all. At uh, today's program here, we have Pennsylvania Railroad Goes Away Ran, presented by Mr. Dave Smoot. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, the United States Army grew rapidly in order to meet the demands of a nation engaged in a world war. And American railroads played a key role in facilitating its growth, with the Pennsylvania Railroad sponsoring five military battalions. Mr. Dave Smoot is going to tell us all about it, and I hope you help me welcome to him to the podium this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Smoot. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Everybody A1 here today? Excellent. Just the way I want to hear it. Uh, first off, I give thanks for thanks is due, not only to Ben for that introduction, but to people who allowed me to do this. This is my first presentation here, and really, they had no clue what it is I do, what I am, yada, yada, yada. Thanks to Vicki back there. She said yes to this. So if there's anything about this you don't like, see her. Uh, I don't think I have to explain to anybody in this room what this is and what it means. It's self-evident. <laughs> this that incident kicked off a whole series of other incidents and I think you pretty well know how we felt the day after that incident we're out looking for blood and we're going to get it no matter what and we're going to start with this fellow right here Admiral Yamamoto who was the mastermind behind that uh, unfortunate December 7th incident and that's an actual statement from him I'm looking forward to dictating peace to the United States and the White House at Washington. He had big hopes. Well, okay, that's the guy we're going after. But not too long after he chimes in, there comes this Austrian paper hanger. He wants a piece of us too. Okay, fine. You want it? Come and get it. And not to be outdone, this sawdust Caesar decides Okay, well, if my two partners are in on this, I'm going for it, too. Okay, it's on. We're in it. We're in it up to the elbows and beyond. The knife to the hilt, uh, the knife to the, to the hilt. What's our answer? You noticed, go back one, these three posters, these guys are asking questions. What do you say, America? 
Here's our answer. Production and more production. And guess what? Pour it on. We will drown these guys and everything and anything that's evil to shut them down permanently. One thing you want to know about us Americans, don't tick us off. You don't want to do it. And just for so, Rosie the Riveter. It's an image most people don't get. This is a Norman Rockwell image. And there's going to be some problems. All this stuff we're going to make is here. It needs to go there, over there. I won't sing it because that, that's where all the fighting is. Well, you can't put one of these things inside one of these things. It doesn't work. Okay, now what? What are we supposed to do? Bring in American railroads. They have the ability, the talent, the means to get large amounts of anything and everything pretty much anywhere on the continent. But again, the war is over there. Here's a picture of some of the, and it's from the Pennsylvania Railroad. It's an advertisement from a magazine. We're sending all sorts of GIs, millions and millions, to go do what needs to be done. Look at them. They're all young. They're all happy. They're all clean shaven. They're confident. That's an ad. That's an actual photograph. Who soiled their K rashes anyway? I mean, look at these guys. But trains, railroads can haul lots of stuff, as I said. Here's a car load, of, a train load of tanks that you can't fit on any aircraft. We can transport men and material to ports of embarkation, yes, but it still needs to get over there. Well, how's that going to happen? LSTs, landing ship tanks. That's, that's what the LST stands for, unless you're in the Navy. Any Navy people here? No? Oh, we got one. You may have heard the term large, slow target which is what they're nicknamed, LST, Large Slow Targets. But they have the capacity to haul large amounts of things like tanks, trucks, big trucks, little trucks. And they can also haul train equipment. How convenient is that? Roll right off and find some rails that haven't been blown up and get to work. And speaking of work, that's what's going to happen. You need a specialized military unit to do this if you're working on a railroad. Hence, railway operating battalions. That's what's going to make it happen. Take a guess, folks. The day after the day of infamy, how many railway operating battalions do we have up and running in service? Could I take a guess? Nothing. You've heard this program before, then. <laughs> You're right. None. None of these things exist. There's one that's in training, and it's in Louisiana, and it's nowhere near ready to be deployed. But that's where we pull the ace out from our sleeves because there's a plan. There's always a plan. The War Department and the American Railroads got together and devised a program by which the railroads will sponsor creation of these battalions. The railroads themselves will offer personnel training on their own equipment at their own facilities, whatever needs to be done. And then they'll turn them loose and we can get the show going. These railroads you see right here, Santa Fe, Atlantic Coast, Burlington, any railroaders here by any chance? Railroad enthusiasts. Okay, this is all for you. These railroads here and these here, plus others not pictured here, they all stepped up to sponsor a railroad battalion, some more than one. But we can't do all of these. This is the Berks County Historical Center. And so we're going to be focused on just two. Pennsylvania Railroad and the Reading Lines. They sponsored battalions and they had people from Berks County working on them. 
if it's for some other county like uh, San Joaquin County in California, we'd be doing Southern Pacific right now. But when all, once all is said and done, that's what you're going to get. That's a mission statement, and that is pulled from one of the railroad operating battalions biographies. The mission of the Military Railway Service is to provide prompt and dependable transportation by rail of troops and supplies required by the military forces in the execution of the tactical mission assigned to the combat force. That pretty well says it all. And uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Radiant Lines. The Pennsylvania Railroad sponsored five different battalions of railway workers, one of which, the 756, is a shop battalion. The shop battalions are supposed to re do perform major repairs on locomotives and equipment to keep them rolling. The other four, their job is to get stuff moving from A to B. Now, the Reading Railroad sponsored the 712th operating battalion. And of all the battalions you saw, well, let's kick this back. Of all the battalions here in a total of six, five of them went to the European Theater of Operations to do battle against those guys. One, the 730th, did not get sent over to the European Theater. It got... Let me tell you... How about, how about we let one person who was there describe it? Captain Stanley Smith, chaplain of the 730th Railway Operating Battalion. The village as a whole had so sickening a stench that we rarely visited it. We saw natives at the riverbank. One man would be washing meat in the dirty water. Another unconcernedly taking a bath. A third cleaning a few fish heads and a woman washing clothes or dishes. All within the narrow space of a few of a dozen feet or so. Sounds appetizing, doesn't it? That's a place you want to go to based on that advertisement, right? Y yeah. What, where are we talking about? What are we talking about? What's all this about? Well, it's the Middle East. That one battalion is going to the Persian Gulf. The war in 1991, Gulf War One, Operation Desert Storm. Now, that was really Gulf War Two. This one is Gulf War One, although nobody ever called it that. The Persian Gulf Command. PGC was known by the people who were there as people going crazy. And here's a close-up of the area. The Persian Gulf Command covered Iran, Iraq, Bahrain, Kuwait, and the Gulf of the Persian of the Persian Gulf, bordering against the Saudi coastline, and also the Gulf of Oman. And the people who served there in the Persian Gulf Command call themselves the FBI, Forgotten Bastards of Iran, for good reason. And this is the patch. This is the patch for the command for the Persian Gulf. Oh, it's totally dummy. It shows a shield in green. Green is supposed to represent the fertile Tigris and Euphrates River valleys. And it's also the color of Islam. The seven-pointed white star comes from the Iraqi flag, and the red scimitar comes from the Iranian flag. That's what that's all about. And if you're going there, you're going to encounter some differences in what you've been accustomed to back in the States. So you're going to issue some guides to help you stay out of trouble. One for Iran, one for Iraq. And since it's probably a dead giveaway that you don't know anything about the foreign languages, you're going to get a language book. One for Persian and one for Russian. It helps to know a few phrases of Russian because the Russians are there. There's lots of Russians there. As a matter of fact, up here on my field desk about a sampling of rations, and some of them are Russian rations. The Russians are here, we're here, the Brits are here, the East Indians are here. It's all a very much a cooperative effort, and soldiers like to trade rations back and forth. Oh, what do you got? Well, I got this over here. You want some? Because I don't, I hate this stuff. 
I want what you got in your hand. It's we, we eat pretty well here. Yeah. Now, the reason that the Persian Gulf Command exists is to keep Russia in the war. Russia at the time, Soviet Union, big deal, it's just a name change, same people, same goals. Russia is tying down half the German armed forces. And if Russia goes billy up, because they've done this before, there's going to be a whole bunch of German infantry, German aircraft, and those damn panzers who don't have anybody to shoot at anymore, and they're going to run around looking for somebody to shoot at. Three guesses who that's going to be. First two guesses don't count. And, of course, these guys, whoop, what did I do? Huh. Those damn panzers. See, I told you. They're all battle-tested. They're all battle-hardened. They've got good equipment. They know what they're doing. And we are sort of noobs at the job. But, oh, well, that's going to change. Here is an engineer of the 730th working in Iran, uh, sometimes called a hogger, sometimes called a pig mauler. Other words I can't use in mixed company. He's riding on a diesel. Most of the locomotives sent to Iran and to Europe, for that matter, too, are going to be steam driven. But there are a few diesels here and there. This is another shot of the 730th territory. The 730th covers an area that's a transition area between desert and mountains. This is the desert. That's the mountains. And even higher mountains, lots of mountains. It gets so hot in the desert in Iran that if you ride on a diesel, you have to leave the louver doors open because if you don't do that, the engines will overheat and seize up. It's that hot over there. Nasty business. And then there are the Russians. Here are some Russians here. There are guards. The Russians are uh, trigger happy, shall we say. They're very protective of Uncle Joe Stalin's equipment that's being sent to fight the fascists during the great war of patriotic liberation, as the Russians call it. Well, they're so trigger happy that if they see anybody, and this includes Americans, because there were incidents who they think is messing with their train, it's not their train, just the cargo's yours, buddy, They'll open fire. It happens if there's a language disconnect here. And I'm not sure. Okay. Who's in the photograph besides those two GIs? Any guesses? Can you make it out? I'll give you a hint. Ingrid? Yes, Ingrid Bergman. And... These guys here are in the 730th, and they're just waiting for chow, and they're smiling. They haven't looked this happy since the last time they were standing at chow. Now, how does all of this actually work? It's one thing to talk about strategic decisions and maps on a pin, pins on a map, whatever. The guys who have to make it work are, are somewhere down there. How does it work? How do you move trains overseas? I think I heard my phone ring. Did you hear my phone ring? You heard my phone ring. Yep, sure you did. Watch what happened. The road station, E-O-R-O-U-D. One of the regulations, you have to spell the name of the station because someone... They don't resonate well with American theater. Operator Smith speaking. That's going to be somebody either north of me or south of me at my little station, which may be a mud hut with tar paper roof. And they want to know, is my block clear? In the States, when you have electric signals, you can run trains and you don't need a lot of people along the line to monitor it. The engineers just have to keep track of the signals. Well, in theaters where either there were never any signals to begin with, or they're all blown the hell, 
what do you do? You put people every so often along the areas and connect them by phone so that they can make a call to ask, is your block clear? He's got a train, it wants to go, it can't go till I say yes. And if my block is clear, I'll issue this clearance form, which is essentially a permission ticket to say to the engineer and uh, conductor, if I have a train waiting, that yes, it is your permission to go. He even says in the lower corner, this form of authority to pass stop indication. And the person who's calling me, he has a similar form. If I say yes, my block is clear, he gives the form to him. That form is only good till it gets to me. Let me start the process over again. What is very wrong here? Not we can. So, in a perfect world, and I think we know where that goes, there are timetables, there are printed schedules of when trains are supposed to arrive at a certain station, when they're supposed to leave that station, how long is it going to take them to get to the next station. Stuff happens. So, you have this certificate. There's a person whose job it is to go around up and down the line and test everybody's watches against a master clock to see if they actually are keeping good time. Because if they aren't keeping good time, you may have what is known as a cornfield meet. That is railroad slang for a head-on collision. And uh, that's not good. That's not, yeah. Ruins everybody's day. Now, let's get down to some personalities here. These are people I've been able to positively identify as coming from Berks County and who serve in the railway system. These are from the 712th, and they were sent to Europe. Mr. Plank, Mr. Duffner, Mr. Blitz, Wesley, Mr. Wesley, and Mr. Schaefer, all from Brennan except for Mr. Wesley from Laureldale. They served the nation and the cause of freedom in the service of the railway operations. And then we have the 712 right there. That's a group photograph of them. One of them may be the people that we mentioned. It's hard to tell. And this is also the 712. They're somewhere in Germany, and that's a German locomotive under new management. <laughs> I'm being polite when I say it. And either one of those could be any one of these. I have no way to tell the caption was not that specific. And then we have sponsored by the Pennsylvania Railroad, the 724th Railway Operating Battalion. And Mr. Fryer from Fleetwood, he was part of that. And I got a couple of stories about the 724th that I think you'll appreciate. When you're dealing with railroads, even in this country, there's always a chance that something may catch fire. And overseas in a war-torn environment, the equipment's not up to snuff, the brakes not, yada, yada, yada. Stuff happens, stuff happens. One day, there was a boxcar on the line of the 724th, and it caught fire, and that's just billowing flames and smoke everywhere. What's in the car? Do you know? There could be ammo in that car, and you don't want to be anywhere near there when it goes off. But the thing is, it has to get out of there. You have to take that car and put it somewhere else so an explosion doesn't touch off everything else, because it could. So some very courageous people got a little switch engine, grabbed a hold of that car, uncoupled it from the rest of the train, hauled it up to somewhere safe, and then went... And it, it did blow. I mean, it blew that boxcar all to pieces and scattered beans everywhere. It was a car loaded with canned beans as part of the GI ration. The heat caused the cans to expand, and eventually they just went kablooey or kabini, whatever. That's one story. 
And here's another. And this one is specific to Mr. Fryer here, Bill Fryer from Fleetwood. He was guarding some German POWs when there was nothing else to do for him. And the POWs, the prisoners, they were all just yammer, yammer, yammer. There was over and nobody's shooting at them any, anymore, which is nice. They, they're talking. And what they don't know is his first language at home was Pensafanish Deutsch. He knew every word they were saying. And I'm sure that if he heard something that might be useful to the intelligence people, he would pass it on. And who else we have here? These are 724th people. Another diesel. And I don't know what to make of the gentleman second from the left in that cap. He may have traded his own cap to one of the Ruskies or the Ruskies cap. I have no idea. And we have the uh, shop battalion. Russell Hilsinger of Reading, Alan Helmick of Boyertown. The individual railway battalions have a company devoted to maintenance, but not heavy duty shop repairs. So there are shop battalions. And this one again was stationed in Europe. They are responsible. This is a picture of that unit. Those are the engines that the unit has to keep up and running all the time. If there are any repairs that need to be made, major stuff, they do it. And they also work on cars too. It's not just the locomotives. What's, what's a locomotive without a car? And then, Chicago and Northwestern. When I originally concocted up this whole program, I was only going to confine myself to Reading Railroad veterans that I could find who served in railway units or Pennsylvania Railroad people from Berks County who served in railway units. I came across people from Berks County who were not with either one of those railroads. So technically, they're outside the scope of this but I am not going to ignore them. Robert Urich from Reading, Lee Putt from Reading. They were part of the 714th and they also got sent to Europe to do their thing. The Northwestern had an agreement with another railroad, the Central of Georgia. The North Chicago and Northwestern sponsored the creation and activation of the Mattayan, but the training, beyond basic training, training on how to run a railroad, that was done by the Central of Georgia. They were cooperating with each other. And then, that's where the 714th got sent. There's, well, I back up. They didn't exactly go overseas, but since Alaska is not a state at the time, they're sort of outside the boundaries of the United States theater of operations. Anyway, there's the summer vacation spot you've all been dying to go to, I'm sure. And they were dying to go to it, too. And some people frolic in the snow and ski in it. Others get to shovel it out so that the train can roll. And again, that's the same unit. And just to prove that it doesn't always snow in Alaska, I think it doesn't snow, what, June 4th through June 7th? That's the same unit, and it's in the dry spell. There's actually some sunshine there. And from the seaboard rail line, way, way down south, we have Edward Bernhardt as part of the 722nd. He was from Reading. It's sometimes difficult to find, well, it's not sometimes difficult. It's quite often difficult finding who served where. Finding names is not that hard. It's tedious, flip, 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 a page, flip a page, but finding, well, where were they from? You don't always get that in the research. Luckily, I found Mr. Bernhardt and Mr. Fryer and all the rest of them. And this is of that unit, the 722nd. Notice they're armed. Stuff happens. And these guys, there's a group photo of the 722nd, and the person I found may very well be one of them. You never know. Can't tell. 
Now, this next one, if you stare real close at the bumper of the Jeep that these two Jeep jockeys are standing next to, you can barely make out what it says, 722ROB. That's a Jeep for the 722nd Railway Operating Battalion. And we also have the 733rd, who was trained by, or sponsored by, and trained by, Central of Georgia. Raymond Bossler and Carl Greenwald. Mr. Bossler from Reading and Carl, I know new updates are ready to install. Just shut up. This is my program, not yours. Go away. But, and Mr. Greenwald from Temple. And remember I said stuff happens? It uh, had a very unfortunate meeting with uh, a bomb. And these are two, two fellows right there from the unit. And if you look over the gentleman on the right shoulder, you see him partially blocking 733rd RY, railroad. I can't make out the last letter. But yeah, this is also under new management. You see the Eagle and Swastika in between them. Used to be theirs, it's ours now. Captured it fair and square. And from the Southern Pacific, Delmar New from Reading in the 716th. They also went to Europe. They landed at one of the beaches in Normandy long after D-Day and worked their way across Europe, going through France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and finally into Germany. For some reason, I haven't come across any railway operating battalion, American, that made its way in the hollow. That I'm guessing when I say this, that might be because that's Field Marshal Montgomery and his British people's territory. I'm guessing they have an equivalent of a railway operating battalion. I have no idea. But that's some of the unit right there. And you see SNCF on the boxcar off to the far left. Anybody here speak French? A lot of help you guys are. <sighs> Société Nation Na French National Railway. That's what the SCNF. That's their term for French National Railway. The F stands for France. I can do that. And those are the fellows from that unit. And this is them performing maintenance, <clears throat> not substantial maintenance, but just maintenance on a locomotive. And the same unit is doing the same with this right here. And next, that unit we just mentioned, the, what did I say, seven, yeah, the 7 16th, on May the 8th, 1945, they crossed into the Rhine. They crossed the Rhine. Anybody here take a guess what the uh, other important thing happened on May 8th, 1945? Big pardon? The bridge? Uh, not with them on it, I hope. Germany surrendered. You see, they knew, they knew that these guys from Reading were coming. They just said, okay, that's it. We're, if, if Reading's coming, we're giving it up. It, that's the day the surrender was signed. And after that, Peace and everybody gets to go home after a while. This is a memorial in the Pennsylvania Railroad's 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. And the memorial commemorates the 1307 Pennsylvania Railroad employees who gave up all of their tomorrows so we could have our todays. Stuff happens. Now with that, are there any questions, folks?